Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Amanda Hunt, the Director of Education and Public Programs here at MOCA. Uh, tonight, we are thrilled to introduce a lecture by way of reading by the singular Greg Tate. Uh, Tate is a writer, cultural critic, and musician. He has written extensively about black aesthetics and film, music and contemporary art, often mixing and collapsing the two in essays or in conversation. Tate began his career as a writer at The Village Voice in 1987, where he worked until 2005, and he's been taking us to task since then. He's interviewed the likes of Ice Cube and Miles Davis, written about legends such as Amiri Baraka, Richard Pryor, and Michael Jackson, and has taught courses on Africana studies and Afrofuturism at Brown, Yale, and Columbia uh, universities, soon to be Princeton as well. His work has been published in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Art Forum, Downbeat, Essence, Jazz Times, Rolling Stone, and Vibe Magazine. Tate's first book, a collection of essays titled Fly Boy and the Buttermilk, Essays on Contemporary America, was first published in 92. In 2016, Fly Boy 2, The Greg Tate Reader, an update on the former, was published. His other titles include Midnight Lightning, Jimi Hendrix and the Black Experience, and James Brown's Body and the Revolution of the Mind. Tate established Burnt Sugar, an improvisational free jazz band inspired by Sun Ra and Parla Parliament Funkadelic in 1999. They continue to play today and will actually this weekend at the Underground Museum on Saturday evening. So tonight, uh, Greg will be reading an upcoming essay that will be a part of a Fight On published monograph on Carrie James Marshall. Uh, so let's please join me in welcoming Greg Tate to the podium. Okay, so good evening. Thanks for coming out. Um, this is not a PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to find your own points of connection between what I'm going to read and uh, what's on the screen. Um, I wanted to just uh, create a file that put Carrie in conversation with um, the black tradition of image making uh, that preceded him and to, of which he is a contemporary part. And, um, and just get that kind of visual dialogue going on um, while I went through my, my emotions here. So um, this essay that I wrote um, for the monograph is called The Marvelously Black Familiars of Carrie James Marshall. I gave up on making art a long time ago because I wanted to know how to make paintings, but once I came to know that, reconsidering the question of what art is returned as a critical issue, Carrie James Marshall. I've never seen a grand epic narrative painting with black figures in it. And that's the kind of painting that I became interested in making, pictures in the grand manner. White figures in pictures, representative of ideal beauty and humanity, are ubiquitous. The truth of this reality is almost everywhere taken for granted. And to me, that's unacceptable. I have lots of young nieces and nephews. They should encounter a broader representation of human ideals than the post-imperial models I had to work against. Carrie James Marshall. Extreme blackness plus grace equals power, Carrie James Marshall. Abstraction makes one love material objects all the more, Adrian Piper. There is a bleakness to objectified blackness. We know it well from the jury unrepressed stereotypes which return to us nightly via TV news, comedy, and drama. Those codified 21st century minstrel show images of black America which read as propaganda footage to many of us in abject framing of the race by operatives who mean neither us nor the country any good in the way of truth, beauty, and inter-ethnic understanding. What they refuse to show is more pernicious than what they allow. The vibrant and varied discourse of everyday life in black America, that sweet flypaper of life as it is actually lived in communities with the same rich complement of human types as can be found anywhere else. 
contrary to popular entertainment, criminology, and hysteria. To recognize that the diversity of blackness, per Rasan Roland Kirk's militantly colloquial spelling, which American contains, would be to recognize there is such a place as that interzone poet Elizabeth Alexander once totemized as the black interior, that such a zone of maximal functivity is primarily a psychic space where flotillas of self-actualized black subjectivities roam about, walk about, and roust about, free and clear. <clears throat> now there is an obliqueness to subjectified blackness to which attention must be paid as well as there is also a buoyancy and a bounce and a bounce to that free black thing, a free black thing which must be metaphysically and formally apprehended if one's obsession is covering metonymic blackness with paint and portraiture. The task will require a certain mastery of polyrhythm, demand one be a rhythm master, as Carrie James Marshall tagged his graphic novel-inspired series of the same name. All this is to say that if you happen to own the black interior, which belongs to Carrie James Marshall, and you dare take up the ambitious outlier mission of rendering the interiors of the black hole, with a W, that loud, proud, obsidian realm saturated with oscillating frequencies, swooping modalities, spiky plateaus, swampy valleys, funky declensions, cosmic accents, elaborate headrooms, and wickedly salty tale, tall tales, well, they've already reckoned with apprehending the liminality of American blackness, the half-hidden, half-revealed qualities of that free black thing which Duke Ellington believed imbued all truly black expression with an aristocratic air of what the Duke called transblusency. In order to render such a vol voluble and vaunted darkness visible on campus, one must also learn to not only paint in the grand manner of European, European, European paintings grandmasters, but must develop skills at mimetically capturing the nuances and shades those of the culture would immediately identify as sui generis, black looks, black cool, black swag, and to being seen acting out while black as well. The artist who assumes these as his baseline tasks will have a fine appreciation for the very theatrical art of putting on shows while black, both public and private. He or she will also show a refined talent for knowing how to interpret the operatic theater of everyday blackness in grandiloquent and architectonic manner. As the work of modern paintings rhythm master Marshall clearly demonstrates, any artist devoted to portraying black life in the grand manner must become learned and fluid in the many dialects of not only black visuality, but black vocality as well, which is to say, um, they must have an understanding that the work has to sing spectacularly too. Such a painter must come correct, intimating a healthy respect for the velvet lined basement of Melvin Edwards' bass voce and the penthouse high grind of Eddie Kendricks' falsetto. She or he must lead our eyes to believe their palette, underpainting and outlines are tinged with a fine tuned appreciation for the subvocal secretive registers of our best crooners and for the most lucid, lush, and rambunctious qualities of same. We should walk up to the work feeling here is a painter that is as devoted to the begging and pleading 1956 James Brown of please, 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 as they are to the 1972 Godfather of Soul who dropped a big payback on the world like an uppity anvil. When seen in full retrospective, when seen in full retrospective, the work of Carrie James Marshall provides a wailing panorama of ebonic vitality that magnificently leaps from the gallery walls, issuing a resounding, relentless chorus of unapologetic, high-posting blackness. <clears throat> Marshall's work provides us with an art-viewing experience unique to his oeuvre, a rhapsodic and enraptured body of iconographic portraiture, heaven-sent and hell-bent on depicting black bodies in various states of recreation, relaxation, prestidigitation, play, flight, mourning, wistful repose, romantic infatuation, bombastic posturing, and deathly, deathly somnolence. Seen in curated total, Marshall's work is a celebratory assembly of black hole representations whose cup filleth over with a hermeneutic Negro city made visible and legible on the whitest walls Western civilization has to offer. We should add, however, that besides black bodies caught mid swagger, Marshall's work also embraces the visual bounty provided by the elegant bric-a-brac bric 
aesthetic of many, of many black American residential interiors. Those shrines of domesticity and self-taught interior decorating many of us know from visiting the older women in our families. Woefully underdocumented sites full of distinctly tribal notions of hearth, home, and mise en scene. Marshall does justice to his own memories of these bold and vivacious oases of familial comfort and tranquility by making paintings in which black folk can appear as holy ghosted figures and sacred ground, statuary subjects, inanimate objects, extraterrestrial beings, and worldly somebodies, dispossessed fallen angels, and somebody's lost black angel tile, too. Those knowledgeable of Marshall's development know that once he was aesthetically lost until he found via an aha moment while reading uh, Ralph Ellison's uh, novel, Invisible Man, uh, in the early 1980s. This epiphonic encounter came during an acute moment of doubt provoked by an artistic impasse the artist had come to while working with collage and abstraction. Ellison's meditations on the central paradox of black being in America, the invisibility blues by any other name, the sense of oneself as both dismissible absence and monstrous other in the presence of whiteness, directed Marshall to his, grand, to his creative ground zero and Odyssean goal, the desire to conjure up paintings of black subjects in the grand manner <clears throat> that could eye-poppingly burst their way into world-class museum contention, those edifices where his grand masterworks of privileged blackness would be given their painly due amongst Marshall's adopted forebears, the grand masters of the Italian Renaissance and their Dutch, Flemish, Spanish, and French successors. Marshall's come to Jesus moment via Ellison also led the artist to innovate techniques that could communicate the primacy of tribe, place, and movement for black Americans. And yes, we do intend movement to be taken in the political, spatial, and ambulatory senses of the term, especially since Marshall's work, like his own life, deeply affected by the migrations of black folk from the American South to the nation's eastern, midwestern, and western states, and the forms of cultural genius they brought to such majestic flowering in them. The industrialized trade in kidnapping and transporting Africans to the Americas for enslavement has led some to speak of us as a displaced and homeless people, a people without a self-governing homeland to call their own. This read has certainly been compelled and exacerbated by our ongoing tortured relationship with the nation state. Our families have contributed to making an empire despite endless rebuke for generations. The absurdity of black citizenship being in quotation marks after nigh 20 generations haunts American democracy and black nationalism alike. Not least because the notion of black, American as a no black America as a nowhere land can erase the indelible histories of large community building black folk have done in multiple sites on the country's map. Sites that black folk have made synonymous with the cartography of deepest, darkest America. Atlanta, Jacksonville, Charlottesville, Macon, Philadelphia, Chicago, Little Rock, St. Louis, Cleveland, Dayton, Detroit, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, South Central Los Angeles, Oakland, Houston, Memphis, Birmingham, New Orleans, Brooklyn, Harlem, Queens, South Bronx, et al. These are all places whose names immediately sum up visions of a nationwide spanning black metropolis. These are also places where by late mid-century, millions of black Americans had established deep multi-generational roots, built homes, innovated several globally influential music genres, lavishly decorated homes, gardens, and business interiors, grown extended networks of families and friends, created segregated utopias, instituted venerable rituals, sanctified ancestral lore, concocted the, the country's most indelible indigenous cuisine and ingrained magical vernaculars into the native tongue. Marshall's project gloriously reminds when not reproaches the elite eyes of the nation with these truths. To go on unseeing and underrepresenting the black omnipresence amassed in America's great cities is tantamount to allowing mainstream America to go on denying its debts to the people who so generous, generously gave them the blues, not to mention gospel, soul, jazz, rock and roll, and therefore the idiomatic zeitgeist scores for the nation's favorite sporting contests, rom sporting contests, romantic rites of passage, and saloon rituals of male bonding and mating. <laughs> These omissions still carry consequence for a nation struggling to reckon with the fact that its faux whiteness is tar-brushed with blackness. In pictorially disabusing, uh, disabusing other Americans of their pure white delusion on museum walls, Marshall, like Ellison, has extended our movement for justice to the art historical and art institutional arena. As stated before, Marshall f found in the Invisible Man's take on black liminality a primal site for his own practice.
But there are strong connections between the novelist and the painter to be found in that novel's free-ranging and promiscuous deploy of varied literary forms, classical to modern, ivory tower sanctioned to outlaw pulp. One discovers a similar tack in Marshall's own mashup <clears throat> of styles, gestures, genres, conceits, and tropes taken from the length and breadth of visual history, pre pharaonic and sub-Saharan African to abex to psychedelic to post-postmodern. When it comes to canvassing the blackness of blackness, Marshall has proven himself to be a trickster-like adept with a boundary, boundaryless imagination. We should at this moment, though, mention our suspicion that Allison, Ellison may have served as a negative inspiration of something not to do in his own practice. That oppositional choice relates to Marshall having made diverse ideations of black femininity a strong, striking feature of his canon. In related news, we'll also interject that Ellison's successor in black authorial ledger domain, Toni Morrison once delivered a devastating one-line critique of Ellison's central trope. To wit, invisible? To whom? Sister Morrison was given a snarkily inquiry. Not to me. Drop the mic and let the church say amen, Rob. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Sister Morrison wasn't just performing a takedown of Bro Brother Rouse's major blind spot there, namely his fabulous noirs near a ratio of black women as equally and doubly conscious American race witnesses. No, Morrison isn't just upbraiding Ellison's refusal to see the sisters, fellow, fellow travelers in real life of his book's plethora of male archetypes traumatized by optical marginality under the glare of white supremacy, ones possessed with their own special laser scope insight into the politics of racial sexual hysteria rampant throughout this legalized lynching land. Morrison's joke at Ellison's expense also leads us to Ellison's strong suit, his metaphoric highlighting of black folk being perceived as less than human in America. Morris subversively addresses the hypervisibility of black women within the frame across racialized gender lines, a state of affairs uh, did I read that right? Morrison subversively addresses the hyper invisibility of black women within the frame across racialized gender lines, a state of affairs abundantly and absurdly evident to most black Americans, yet still remarkably opaque to many outside the group. Even when said outsiders are confronted with un unambiguous footage of unarmed black folk being beaten, shot, or choked to death by rabid peace officers, given the tendency even, among, even by the Black Lives Matter movement's female leadership to focus near exclusively on black male martyrs, Marshall's overt investment in situating wide, a wide range of black femininities in his work provides one of his painting's signature progressive features, ethical triumphs, and most salutary sources of aesthetic pleasure. Decades ago, Martin Luther King railed against the thingification of black humanity in America, that thingification being perhaps the longest running conceptual performance in the wing of the nation most devoted to sustaining white supremacy, a gambit whose playing field required the conscious, partic the conscious participation of every legislative and represent representational institution in the society. Marshall's art for comp compensations for the thingification, <clears throat> well, Marshall's artful compensations for the thingification of women in blackness informs us that the artist enjoys having his work cut out for him. It also tells us that Marshall's three decades marathon of productivity towards a more perfect union of darkness and visibility in major museums echoes King's recognition that laws and souls had to be reformed and transformed by the civil rights movement. Like his, abolition, like his abolitionist forebears, King possessed a spot on sense that the dreamy nether regions of the American psyche was where language and lore fused to reify racist laws, culture, and behavior, just allowing supremacist sheriffs, county clerks, mayors, presidents, and congresses to translate thingification into national belief and hysteria-driven over and in a, in a hysteria-driven over-policing system. Repelling the assaults of these blindly and legally blinding myths on living black bodies and minds is what radical black culture has been obsessed with since the days of the black arts movement. In forwarding that radical insurgency with his easels, paints, and brushes, Marshall has held up his end on behalf of the beautiful struggle in the art historical and art institutional arena of the black arts movement's contemporary anterior. Okay, let me take a a public enemy commercial break. <laughs> this style seems wild, way before you treat me like a stepchild. Let me tell you why they got me on file, cause I give you what you lack, come right and exact. Our status is the saddest, so I care where you at, black. Chuck D, louder than a bomb. Uh, 
So I'm actually going to skip ahead. Okay. We, in fact, cannot speak of American blackness in, in the vernacular, literally the language of slaves, without recognizing that our kind of darkness visible, our kind of absurdist absence and abundant presence has come to possess a certain high-tech nuance and finesse at this stage of history, a dynamic, high, highly mobilized and motivated prowess at projecting black culture's millennial gospel, hyper-virtuality, and, and hyper-visibility, and its insider outlier sensibilities through sheer viral aggregation and aggression. The will to visibility through virtuality and visuality via hip hop's first strike incursions into the digital diaspora accounts for how contemporary black American culture has insinuated itself into, world, into the world's post-millennial social networks. Marking the coincidence, the coincidence of Marshall's virtuosic storming of the art world during the same period that hip hop and August Wilson marshaled their assaults on theatrical and rock culture hierarchies is unavoidable. Not least because of the successes of Wilson, Marshall, and hip hop in putting colloquial come classically proficient black artists in places where they weren't yet common features, let alone mainstays and trailblazers, was very, a very spook who sat by the door, kind of Trojan horsey thing. That stealthy and stellar course correction through culture for the nation's race dialogue had become mandatory by the 1980s, particularly since the Reagan era meant a rollback of expansive minority rights and rebooting in the mainstream American psyche and popular media, of black folk being bete noir synonyms for poverty, ignorance, crime, mass incarceration, gang warfare, sexual deviance, civil disobedience, social marginality, subhumanity. Marshall belongs to a generation of black artists whose work in the 1980s and 1990s had the effect intended or not to function as a counterweight to the burdensome stereotypes America's gatekeepers and presidential campaign advisors, with, can advisors within deploying to stigmatize, marginalize, and dehumanize black folks on site. One is struck not only by those artists' interpenetration of lily white cultural milieus and metiers and the black community's revolutionary style councils, but also by the indefatigable productivity of, of each of the artists. It's almost, as, it's almost as if as a group they decided on a near superhuman defiance of mortality and distraction in mounting their epic sustained campaigns against black exclusion from the ranks of America's cultural elite. Skip ahead again. Marshall's work has often been discussed in reference to his deep curiosity about and conquest of Western art making technique as vocation, as valorizing force. But rarely do we find him discussed within the tradition, within the Western tradition of black American figuration that proceeds and runs parallel to his work. How can we talk about Marshall's quest for a black artistic mastery and exclude at least indexing so many other black figurative masters, Henry Ottawa Tanner, August, Augusta Savage, Buford Delaney, Archibald Motley, Romare Bearden, Jacob Lawrence, Charles White, Bob Thompson, David Hammonds, Jeff Donaldson, Barley Hendricks, Lorna Simpson, Carol Walker, John Michelle Basquiat immediately come to mind, as do the plethora of Marshall's uh, current comrades and art world contemporaries. Because regardless of medium and types of pictorial virtuosity, all share a common project and a common representational come conceptual problematic. How to translate the haunting of the blank pictorial canvas by the crossroads of black visuality and one's own hyperactive black imaginary. These translations invoke cultural politics to which, to, to which attention must be paid. Marshall's project evokes a quite phenomenal accounting from within Western art, historical scholarship no less, of black bodies, faces, and iconic figures on pan-temporal parade within the Euros Eurocentric museum canon. The centuries Spanning collection of visual pictorial sculptural blackness can be found in a mammoth multi-volume series of books instigated by the legendary modernist patron Dominique de Menil and directed um, by her comrades towards the publication of the book The Image of the Black in Western, Western Art. Skip again. As a one-man whirlwind of canon reformation, Marshall, as seen in his traveling retrospective mastery, has made the museum's long dalliance with Afrophilia his own imagery, one that encyclopedically draws freely upon period and type of iconographic, iconographic gesture. Like, taint nobody's business if you do. In the process, he has also given a roaring and refined voice to a few centuries worth of black pictorial yearnings to be seen, heard, and marveled before. Yeah. 
As Marshall's painting evolved over the 80s and 90s, he began to give us an exploded view of a hybridized urban pastoral space grounded in what the cultural critic Lisa Kennedy once described as the black familiar. Those aspects of everyday black metropolitan life which fly against the pathologizing grain of mass media stereotype and that even as reportage may be read as exotic or mundane to the culturally deprived. Anyone who has spent time as an ardent near or even a casual observer of those places where black lives matter most, like the bustling common spaces of Marshall's boyhood home of Los Angeles and Chicago, the Chicago he spent his most productive adult years in, and this writer's own Harlem knows the familiar plays host. The familiar plays host to the spectacular every minute of the day. For as keen a recorder as Marshall of his people's hairstyles, stares, glares, sears, fashion statements, runes, ruins, monuments, and movements, the panorama set before one offers a profuse embarrassment of visual, sartorial, and scenic riches. For an artist as disciplined as Marshall, in his tabulation and fabulation of those riches within his pictorial frames, there's a quality of festival, festive containment, which, remind, which reminds one most of magisterial Latin American writers such as Borges, Neruda, Fuentes, Carpentier, Vargas Llosa, Cabrera Infante, Garcia Marquez, Isabella Allende, and Clarice Lispector, all of whom dealt in a masterful mythopoeic restaging of the carnivalesque crossroads they daily witness in their unique para-Western cultures. A quarter century before Marshall begins his mission, those writers were forming the vanguard of modern literature at a time when the novel and even authorship was thought of in some cosmopolitan Policy and academic circles as in a crisis of relevance to the revolutionary age. Most of these writers were as educated in literary modernity and critical theory as their European counterparts, but they all reached different conclusions about the fiction and poetry's currency and capacity to radically experiment with form and speak fluently to a broader audience than the academy. Especially Marquez, whose grand novel, 100 Years of Solitude, translated in 37 languages and sold over 30 million copies since its release in 67, boisterously disproved the notion that serious literature and its authors were incapable of uh, still gathering the global village around the campfire, competing with the instant gratifications of mass electronic media. Marshall's paintings likewise upset the postmodernist holy grail that painting must be ironic or cannibalizing or self derisively gestural to eschew and render less digestible its privileged, precious position as the most marketable, marketable staple of the art market. Marshall has several works that mock paintings' illusions of verisimilitude and mimesis by privileging instead the painter's potential for whimsy, random distortion, riotous blurring into the process of self portraiture. In several of these pairings, he makes a black woman artist of, of exceptional grandeur and nobility his avatar. The biggest mistake a viewer of Marshall's work would make would be to assume he's addicted to classical technique in the service of some precious notion of realism. Marshall is unavoidably a surrealist simply by painting extremely blacker than black figures into a grand and base tradition in which they have been excluded because of American skin politics and not poetic capacity. In the gallery, his creations impose themselves upon the world with a force and presence equal, if not greater, than the architecture of the person standing next to you in the gallery. As with the best music, Marshall's work brings very black corpulence and weight to bear upon our aesthetic senses in ways that ultimately insinuate uh, it, their way into our nervous systems and in ways that are tactile, embodied, and implosive. Yeah. So I'll stop there. I guess I'm supposed to say, uh, any questions? <laughs> um, yeah. Yes. formal interest in the what we might call the encyclopedic rhapsodic oh, completely. like this yeah. completely like, yeah. what is and can you talk a little bit about 
where you think that drive might come from for Carrie or for you or for you in a shared way as a, as a formal approach to, in your case, language, in his case, images, but to produce this almost, this shower, you know, this too muchness of, of knowledge and affect. Yeah. Well, one way I'll, I'll answer it is um, um, by uh, quoting a friend of mine, uh, Warrington Hudlin, um, who used to run an organization called the Black Filmmakers Foundation. And um, he used to just, you used to just talk about how, you know, the exhaustion of, um, of um, stories that was already evident in Hollywood in the, in the 90s, you know. And he just said, you know, by comparison, um, um, the Pan-African world has 10,000 years of stories that have never been told, you know. And so, you know, when you compare that with um, um, certainly from the beginning of cinema, you've got um, not just, um, you know, people telling various kind of domestic contemporary dramas, but you've got Cecil B. DeMille and uh, D.W. Griffith and, you know, all these folks kind of taking on the history of the world as seen by Europe. So in some ways, and it's been um, repetitiously revisited again and again and again. And, um, you know, we're, um, we're always on the verge, I think, of a black cinematic renaissance in terms of that kind of storytelling. Like, I, I try never to be too optimistic about uh, contemporary breakthroughs, you know, because they're always followed by, um, you know, uh, backsliding, you know, on the parts of the powers that be, you know. Um, but, but I think that um, if you, once you start going down the rabbit hole of any aspect of what we call black culture, you realize how endless it is. Like, uh, uh, you know, one of my mentors, you know, uh, writer A.B. Spellman, um, and, uh, uh, you know, really formidable early jazz critic, compatriot of Amiri Baraka, but, um, you know, we were just talking about vinyl collecting, you know, and he said, yeah, the beauty of it, Greg, is that it's endless, you know, and he just, he, you know, and he meant that in reference to the fact that we could pick, like, any period, any year, you know, and we could just spend all the time kind of uh, resurrecting and zooming, you know, and finding um, this pertinent work that was produced, you know, and that's the case of, uh, in the, I mean, and that's true if you're talking about the visual art, that's talk true if you're talking about uh, the writing, you know, uh, the literature, you know, uh, photography, um, and then there's a way that all of that actually connects up to um, personalities and communities and and tribes and all these cities that I talked about as well, you know. Like, I mean, I had, um, you know, I went to the, the um, uh, National Museum of African American History and Culture in uh, DC, um, which is just a fascinating, um, it's, if you want to speak about, the, you know, they also call, uh, what people call the, the encyclopedic narrative, they call it the literature of exhaustion as well, you know. And the thing about that museum is, um, you know, once you've gone, you tell people, you need two days. You either need two days or you need 10 hours, you know, because um, you're going to want to see everything on all the floors. And, but you're going to start um, with the Portuguese slave trade, and then you're going to work your way all the way through the Americas. And then, you know, but there are these, um, these side trips you're going to take into how, uh, you know, three black women in particular um, were used by the so-called father of American gynecology to develop his techniques. Mm -hmm. You know, he experimented on them and he went, then went on to the world to become, you know. So, I mean, it takes you to all these places and, um, um, you know, it's, it's a journey, as I like to say, from the slave ship to the mothership, you know, because P-Funk's on the top floor and yeah. then, yeah, you know, um, and then beyond, you know, there's a gallery space in there, you know, and that's another, um, um, kind of opening into, um, into a realm that, you know, the museum doesn't even have the capacity to tell the full story of, you know. It's like you need, for all of these subject areas, you know, you probably need a museum, you know, the music, you know, needs its own museum, so forth and so on, you know. Um, and when I was just putting together this, you know, just sampling of people, you know, I mean, we, you realize like we're still in such a culturally segregated world that if I wanna, uh, 
talk, have the conversation, the curatorial conversation that carries in with his own tradition, that needs its own museum with all of these works and the works of all the artists who aren't there. Because there's a particular um, dialogue that's going on uh, between these image makers um, that because of the nature of uh, the art world is, you know, they're all kind of scattered and um, um, uh, lost in some cases, you know, from the conversation that emerges around the more well-known, you know, the Basias and mm -hmm. Cares, the people who were able to, uh, one way or the other, make that breakthrough, you know, into the, into the major museum. So um, you realize that um, um, the, if you go to a place like the museum, but you've done all of this research and reading beforehand, you just realize, <laughs> you know, that, um, wow, I've, I've spent enough time in the library to understand the connection between these 3,000 out of 30,000 objects that they have here, and there's still whole areas of it that are, um, they're almost like a secret sub-history, you know, of, uh, of blackness, mm -hmm. you know, in America. So that's the long, that's, <laughs> that's the long, the long and too much answer to your question. I don't think there's too much that he gave. I don't think there, maybe I didn't understand your question, but I don't think there was too much, but there's not enough because our history is so long it has not been told that I think more that is said, like going through the museum, which I've been, you know, you, the viewer and the listener and the person who wants to learn has to take the time and absorb all that, that the artists on various fields want to give. I don't think there can be too muchness in a response. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, and, I, and I'll tell you, you know, just to return to the to the to the, to the museum. I mean, the thing is, um, uh, if you have spent your life trying to know as much as you can about the subject of the museum, you go in there thinking like, oh, I know the grand narrative of this, so I'm going to. But then you get caught, you know, and then um, you find yourself being, at least I did, um, kind of emotionally struck by certain things, which in a certain context are very abstract. Like one of the first objects um, they got, they actually built the museum around it, was um, uh, a guard tower from the Angola prison. And when you actually walk up on that, you know, uh, for me, it's like you're having a concentration camp experience, you know. Um, totally, completely unexpected, you know, response to um, kind of the ache that's built into that aggregate and the commu acc accumulation of all of these, you know, of the, of the connective tissue of these stories, yeah, so. Uh, yeah, but that's kind of off the, <laughs> off the general point, but, you know, yeah. yeah. It's such calmness in a room after you speak. <laughs> Um, I, I've been to the museum as well, and I, I have to admit, I, I did three days, right. and I didn't finish. <laughs> so, um, but given that about the much, and um, I guess I guess my thing is, is I, I was just so enthralled by your voice. You have such rhythm, all that rhythm there. Um, just as a, um, I guess, I don't know, I don't even want to call you today. You just so many things, but just going back to. Carrie's work a little bit. Mm. How how do we take this work uh, and infuse it into I would say educational systems? Because he's when I, I he speaks on so many different levels. So mm -hmm. how do we move from this space into just I'm gonna, as much as you can with that question? How can we move this space into an educational system that needs it as well? Because the history is there and what you just gave. Well, I think you know he, in that quote I read about you know I have nephews, nieces and nephews. I mean that's embedded in the project, you know. So um, it, the the beauty of museums, of course, as public institutions, is that. Um, you can bring kids in all night and day, you know, well, all day, you know. And um, you can, but with his work in particular, you can have these, um, these rich conversations about, um, well, this is what, this is how this arrest, this artist decided to kind of arrest time in the beauty parlor. 
And, you know, this is the secret society that he decided to portray in the barbershop. And the, the death of Fred Hampton, he gave us is just such an apocalyptic black event that it's, it exists in the sub, you know what I mean? So, um, um, and, you know, I mean, what's, what to me, you know, of course, what's incredibly impressive is that this is a life's work. I mean, I met, I met Kerry, you know, when, just when he and Arthur Jaffa met, um, kind of right before they started to work on Daughters of the Dust. So, um, he, if, you know, in the show, you know, the, the first paintings that you see are, the, are kind of where he was, and now we have the, the, uh, Thanks to the ex exhibition, you know, we also get to see how this vision, this vision has evolved and expanded and revised itself, um, you know, in the work, you know, I mean, and, and we, when you talk about in the work with Carrie James Marshall, you are talking about work, <laughs> you know, I mean, Carrie just kind of beats you down as artists just with his productivity, just the knowledge of it, you know what I mean? I have a friend that lives in uh, uh, Chicago, it's a filmmaker, Colleen Smith, you know, and, um, you know, she said, uh, she said for a couple of years, she was even trying, she was trying to figure out where Carrie's studio was. She found the neighborhood, you know, but it took her uh, like a few months to actually figure out where it was. So she knew, you know, if the light was on, he was in there, you know, and he pretty, he's pretty much in there all the time, you know. Um, so it's such a, um, you know, yeah, I mean, you, you just, you don't arrive at, the kind of rich conclusions that he reached, you know, he arrived at in the in the painting, you know, without just being completely immersed in um, your mission, you know. And I think that's that's one of the things that um, uh, is also amazing is because he uh, he carries it with such grace and so lightly too, you know what I mean? Uh, um, in the work and you know, as a, as a person, you know, um, you know, because the work is not kind of beating you. Over the head with the, with the sense of mission, it just is. It's just there. But then, it just takes. It's just so protean. It's just taking so many metamorphic forms. You know, from painting to painting, from period to period, from style to style. You know, um, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. But like Wu Tang, carries for the kids. I was. Yeah, you know. <laughs> I appreciate both. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm just curious about your thoughts on um, uh, an artist or a filmmaker of a certain gender or race reflecting the experience um, of another gender or race. Are you asking an appropriation question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I I have. Uh, how do, let me see. So, uh, without referencing the recent controversy at the Whitney Biennial, I mean, I have, you know, as uh, as somebody who plays music, I I engage in appropriation all the time. My favorite art form is based on appropriation. What we have historically, uh, but it's it's. Um, what um, I think has been lost is the, what originally generated the, conf the conversation in reference to black culture, you know, uh, um, white appropriators or, you know, is the, uh, the degree to which um, a Jim Crow world meant that you had decades of um, black creative innovators um, whose opportunity to make a living, you know, was short-circuited, uh, was denied um, by people who were promoted in place of them within these idioms that they had developed. So, you know, you can't ever, America can't ever stop being haunted, you know, by the legacy of slavery in everything, in absolutely everything. You know, if you read, um, you know, if you read ta, -Ta Coates' uh, essay on reparations in the Atlantic, you know, um, you know, what's so brilliant about that is just the way he doesn't even, I don't even know if he mentioned slavery once, 
You know, he says, no, we're going to make this contemporary. I'm going to talk about people that couldn't move into certain kind of homes because the government mandated, you know, a racist and exclusionary policy, you know, that didn't change until, you know, until the 70s, you know. Um, and, you know, that took what, what finally broke the back of that was a, a civil war-like event. It was, you know, all these cities that burned up after King, you know, King's assassination. So, um, so all these contemporary conversations are definitely haunted by that by that specter, you know. Now, my other answer to that, you know, uh, you know, uh, that came up in reference to the recent controversy at the Whitney was, well, she's a wealthy white artist. She can do whatever she wants to do, you know. Like, she can steal whatever she wants to steal. She could, uh, well, I don't even want to put it in that term, but it's like that license, you know, comes with white privilege, you know what I mean? But I'm not somebody who's interested in chasing, you know, chasing down for an arrest you know, everybody um, who's um, driven to, who's seduced and, uh, and, made, and moved to make work um, that's reflective of black presence, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, just black capacity, you know, creative capacity in America, you know, because uh, I just think it's a dead end, you know, at a certain level. And I think it proved to be, it just proved to me, it just proved to be such a dead end conversation in New York, you know, around, um, so, you know, it was around an event that was, that was really, um, uh, really kind of brought out the, the kind of worst kind of opportunism on many sides, you know, um, in the contemporary, contemporary art world. So, uh, but, you know, uh, I love the Rolling Stones and Led Zeppelin, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, I love what they did with, with the blues form. I love the Beatles, you know what I mean? Um, and it just becomes, uh, you know, um, uh, yeah, it just, you know, you just, you know, this is the, the, the beauty of being complex, dialectical thinking human beings, you keep, the the history you know of of, of annihilation and and uh, expropriation and theft and commodification of black bodies in mind and you know um, you go on the journey with stairway to heaven you know, to, you know what I mean like you had that capacity you know uh, so. Thank Hi, okay, so continuing in that vein, mm -hmm. um, I would like to, I don't know if this is really a question, but maybe you could just comment on it. I think a lot about um, how art is, I guess, um, how to say this. Um, okay, well, for example, Arthur Jaffa's um, piece down at the Geffen um, Contemporary, um, it has a lot of very strong visual imagery about black life and black sexuality. Um, I kind of feel oppressed when I have to experience it mm -hmm. among other people who kind of just seem cultural tourists in that conversation. Mm -hmm. And um, since we're talking about appropriation, I think that those images have been so pervasive from popular music to film, um, what has been put forth of black life and as it extends to black people, that they have taken them as, um, they've become normalized and they should not have been because I think that there is a perversion there. They are part of black life, but they are not the entire story. Mm -hmm. So I guess my oppression comes from <laughs> people, um, there, is, there is privilege there, just mm -hmm. taking those images um, reductively and saying, well, that's what black people are. So it makes it hard for me to engage with his work um, just on my own terms. Mm -hmm. So maybe if you could just speak about as a black person experiencing African American art um, through the white supremacist patriarchal gaze, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. Also, um, another thing that I was just noticing is you had the picture of Basquiat with his cat, and then another picture of Romare Bearden also with his cat. 
Um, those may not have like. I mean, I, there's a lot of images uh, here. That was that was, that was intentional. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Well, good. Um, but but <laughs> but the thing that I love about the two images is just kind of the sensitivity, and again, what is normal about them? Just showing a slice of their lives, not as artists, not as speaking for any you know artistic truth, just as black men. And I was reading. I don't know. There's yet another book I think about Hemingway and his life. It was either in the one of the Times or the um, the Wall Street Journal, and I think about how much fetishization of just to use Hemingway because there's always a book about him, even though he's a writer, um, about his life. And why are there not books about black male writers and artists and just the totality of their lives to um, to humanize them and not make them symbols, not make them totems, not make them um, revolutionaries even, just men. So you, and I think just that would give people a better sense of who black people okay. so, are so and got, that they wouldn't be able to reduce okay. us to what I had said before. So, so I answered in reverse, I got two names for you, Arnold Rampersett and David Levering Lewis. Um, uh, Rampersett wrote, he, he's written, uh, a, a, um, exhausted bi uh, biographies of Langston Hughes and Ralph Ellison. Um, and uh, Lewis wrote the, um, the encyclopedic uh, narrative of W.B. Du Bois's life, you know. So I mean, yeah, I mean, they, they exist. They're, they're, in, the, they're in, the, in the stacks, you know. Um, but um, yeah, around that, you know, because you really, you're asking this question around um, spectatorship. You know, and um, in some ways, it's a uh, it's a particular it's a it's a, it's going to be a particular burden of your generation to have to experience that kind of work in spaces where um, you feel alienated by who you're sharing the space with. You know, because uh, you know, I mean. Arthur and I both went to Howard University in the 70s. You know, it's like 99% <laughs> black school in a 80% black city. You know, so everything you did was just black. <laughs> you know, um, and and the people. You know, I always just make the case that um, um, I was educated about the world, art, philosophy, poetry, music, everything by black people in Washington, D.C., some in an academic setting, some uh, in formal social setting, you know. So, um, and what, what I think uh, uh, allows A.J. To, to put that particular piece together with such kind of fluency and ease and kind of a, uh, um, uh, fearless claiming of all of those kind of sites of blackness as uh, his own was, it's the historical experience. It's growing up in Mississippi before then, you know, um, in the, um, at the end of the Jim Crow era, then going to Howard, working with Holly Dreamer, working in uh, the black independent cinema movement, you know, I mean, his, his mentors are Holly Dreamer, like literally Holly Dreamer, Charles Burnett, Julie Dash, you know. Um, so, um, and so the white gaze is not in his head. When he makes the work, it's not there. When he <laughs> actually uh, looks at his own work, no matter who's, who's there, you know what I mean? But I just know from my own teaching experience um, at, um, um, you know, various institutions that were mentioned, you know, uh, you know, Brown and Yale and so forth, that um, um, there's a conversation that your generation wants to have with itself, you know, that um, it almost, I think, on a certain level you feel oppressed by wanting to have the conversation, conflicted about it, but there's just a, there's an existential necessity, there's a, a, a kind of, uh, uh, a need for a very specific kind of sharing, you know, of information and and uh, experience and and uh, 
And you know, I mean, he, um, I know from, you know, I'm like, I've shown his piece, I've shown that love is the message um, in, uh, you know, mixed groups, black, white students, you know, and you could tell, I could just tell, um, uh, cause every, I don't know anybody who the first time they see that piece just isn't like rocked, right? You know, I mean, just emotionally, it just takes you, it's a roller coaster. But I can tell like, black students just don't wanna have that conversation in that context. They just won't, they will not give it up. You know, I'm like looking at, I can see it on people's faces, you know what I mean? It's just all the triggers you talked about, all the intensity of feeling like, I mean, just the, the, the conflict between, um, uh, you know, these kind of charged representations of violence against black folks and what some people would consider um, the way he just kind of levels um, the, the iconic models of black culture with, you know, very proletarian, you know, um, people on the street, you know, people in the, in the, in the buckets of blood, in the, in the juke joint, you know what I mean? Like he just levels all of it. So this is all, it's like, you know, Ross, Ross, uh, the Rosses, you know, say it's all in a culture. You know, like if you want to deal with the, the whole of black culture, yeah, he's saying like this is what I cannot not see as somebody who's a gatherer of images, you know, who's attracted to just charged imagery of blackness. You know, the, the force, like look, you know, that's why he's got the, you know, the stars and the, you know, the, the solar showers and flares and all that stuff going on in there. It's like it's all connected to him, you know. But um, I mean, I'm just, you know, I'm just gonna go back and say like. You know, this is, I think every generation just has its own kind of problematic to solve around um, how it connects to um, the larger black community and how, um, you know, that's conflicted or compromised by having to pursue um, an education, uh, a living, uh, so, a certain kind of social stability, you know, in places where you don't feel comfortable, you know, where you feel alienated as a black person, you know what I mean? And, um, uh, but, I, but I think like all of the, you know, to just, you know, go back, you know, you asked about all these writers. I mean, that's, that's in some ways that, that, uh, that conflict is like the core theme, you know, uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the literature, you know, it's trying to reconcile, you know, um, just the, the, the neuroses and anxiety. <laughs> that comes with like uh, being a contemplative black person, you know, uh, in various, you know, in, in among your peers and, you know, uh, you know, among your, uh, among your black peers and your, and your white peers, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you everyone. The museum is now closed. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what too muchness will do. <laughs>